Uh, now, companies like Blackwater increasingly have their sights set on domestic deployments inside of the United States. I was down in New Orleans after Hurricane Katrina hit. I was standing on a corner on Bourbon Street in the French Quarter talking to two New York City police officers. I'm from New York. Uh, and a, a, an unmarked car speeds up next to us. And out of the car pop four just bulky guys wearing flak jackets, khaki uniforms, M4 machine guns, another pistol strapped to their legs. Uh, and they, they come up to the cops and they say, you know, where are the rest of the Blackwater guys? And the New York police officers say, oh, there's a lot of them. They're down the street. And they, they tell them the hotel where they are. And then they get back into the car and they speed off. No license plates on the car. And I said to the, to the police officers, Blackwater, you mean like the guys in Iraq? And he said, oh, yeah, they're all over the place here. So I found some of these Blackwater guys on the street and just struck up a conversation with them. And I said, and so what are you guys doing down here? What's your mission? And they said, we're here to confront criminals and stop looters. And I said, under, under whose authority are you down here? And they kind of fumbled with each other. And then one guy pulls a gold law enforcement badge. He says, I was deputized by the governor of the state of Louisiana. And I was saying, you know, are you, are you guys on federal contract down here? Are you on a state contract? And they said, well, we can't really talk about it, but we're sleeping in a camp organized by the Department of Homeland Security. So I, I, I looked into it a little bit further, and I was able to, to determine that, in fact, the Department of Homeland Security had hired Blackwater to engage in security operations in New Orleans after Hurricane Katrina. And when I got the contracts, it turns out that uh, Blackwater guys on the ground had told me they were getting paid $350 a day. Uh, Blackwater was billing the federal government $950 per day per man for Blackwater operators um, deployed in the hurricane zone. At one point, David, they had 600 men stretched from Texas through Mississippi and the Gulf. They were pulling in about $240,000 a day uh, for security operations in the hurricane zone at a time when there was a scandal over $2,000 debit cards uh, for, for people who were internally displaced. That figure you used, $4 billion on yeah. uh, security in Iraq. Right. Is that $4 billion spent by the U.S. government? Yes, that's, uh, that's according to, to Representative Henry Waxman. Uh, that's something that came out mm -hmm. of the uh, initial hearing he held on Blackwater on February 7th in the Oversight Committee. So these are taxpayer dollars? Oh, yeah, absolutely. So how does the uh, taxpayer know that he's getting his money's worth? Put aside whether it's a good or a bad thing. How do you know you're getting your money's worth? You don't. And that's, uh, and, and that's a major controversy in Congress right now. Representative Jan Schakowsky, who's on the, uh, the uh, Select Intelligence Committee, uh, since 2004, when I've been talking to her about this issue of contractors, she's been trying to get information. Just tell me how many contractors there are in Iraq. Tell me how many contracts we have in excess of $5 million. Tell me how many have been killed. Tell me how many have been wounded. Tell me how many uh, investigations are open at the Justice Department. No answers to any of these questions. And so for years, uh, you have uh, several Congress people, some of them in influential positions, who have been unable to get any information about the operations of these companies. Uh, that's starting to change. Uh, but it took Henry Waxman, uh, since the Fallujah ambush happened of those Blackwater guys, he's been investigating this one contract. He started aggressively doing it in November of 2004. It took him until February 7, 2007, to just get an answer as to whose contract that ultimately was. And it turns out it was a subcontract with KBR. And so now KBR is being forced to give back to the federal government $20 million for unauthorized use of security services in Iraq. Uh, and they inform their shareholders that they may have to return as much as $400 million if the Army continues its investigation. I think earlier you used a figure of 100,000 right. security consultants. No, oh, there's 100,000 private contractors. Private, that includes all the KBR. Right. And then of the military contractors, maybe a fifth of that 100,000 are engaged in military-type activities. So that would include, for instance, CBS hires a security firm in, in uh, Iraq to protect its staff. That, they would be included in the 100,000, but not in the 20,000. Right. The, the, well, I, I actually don't know how that works, uh, because the, the 100,000 figure comes from the Department of Defense census. Uh, but even the Department of Defense has said that it, uh, it's, it's not quite sure how accurate that is. Um, and a lot of uh, independent analysts say it's bigger. Uh, the Government Accountability Office says there are 48,000 employees of private military firms. And of those, uh, s uh, some senior people in Congress uh, say that about 20 to 25,000 are engaged in active military operations. Uh, when a company like CBS hires private security, it would be unclear, do they come out of that pool or do they come out of the pool of private security contractors that aren't on government contract? For, for instance, KBR hires Blackwater outside of its government work to protect its office and do force protection. Um, so it's, it's unclear. I mean, th this is, but th the fact that you, a that you ask it is interesting because it's like a Wild West atmosphere over there. The Times of London said that the, uh, the, 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 the war boom in Iraq is not oil but security. How did you get interested in Blackwater? 
Um, I first went to Iraq in, uh, in 1998. Uh, and it was the first of many trips that I would take to, to Iraq. I, w I went in and out of the country from 98 until 2003 when the occupation began. And I actually had spent time in Fallujah. Uh, in, in fact, in the summer of 2002, I camped out in Fallujah, which now would be a, you know, an unthinkable thing. I, mean, I used to play dominoes on Al Rashid Street in, uh, in Baghdad, which you know, you, you'd be insane to step foot on Al Rashid Street as a, uh, as a, a white American. Um, and, 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 so, and I knew uh, many people in Fallujah and, uh, and knew that city well. It was a beautiful city. They called it the city of mosques. And it was, uh, I, I, you know, I, I had something in my heart for the city of Fallujah. And so when, uh, when this ambush happened of these Blackwater guys, I, I paid very close attention to it. And when the siege of Fallujah happened um, and, and we saw the suffering play out, uh, I started to say, oh, I mean, the, the deaths of four private military contractors was worth the life of an entire city. And mm -hmm. that began the process of looking into them. When I really realized how serious of a story it was, though, was in New Orleans. When you see guys who two weeks earlier had just been in Iraq, all of a sudden deploying on the streets of an American city, heavily armed as though they were in Iraq, I, I just said, this is, this is unbelievable, and started digging into who the, who the executives of the company were. Then you find that they're connected to the Bush administration. They're connected to the Christian right. And in many ways, it embodies a lot of what has happened in the war on terror and uh, in the Bush presidency. So you're sort of like all the rest of us. You, you uh, tumbled to uh, Blackwater uh, as a result of that incident in Fallujah. Oh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, in, in fact, Representative David Price, a Democrat of North Carolina who, uh, who has a legislation making its way uh, on the Hill uh, aimed at contractor oversight, um, he said that he thinks most people in Congress uh, first became aware of this when that ambush mm -hmm. happened. Well, maybe a lot of other people will become aware of it if they read your book. It's called Blackwater, The Rise of the World's Most Powerful mercenary arm. Thanks a lot. Thank you, David. You're watching Book TV, created by cable, offered as a public service. Coming up at 10 p.m. Eastern, a book party for MASH actor and human rights activist Mike Farrell. Then the War of Ideas. Walid Ferris on Radical Islam versus the West. Next weekend on Book TV, Encore Book Notes features a 2003 interview with Michael Howard, author of The First World War. Next Sunday, Ghetto Nation author Cora Daniels looks at the impact the ghetto lifestyle has had on society and corporate America. Also on Sunday, This Mighty Scourge historian James McPherson with perspectives on the Civil War. Here are the 10 best-selling hardcover nonfiction books from the New York Times. The list reflects sales for the week ending March 17th. In an Instant by Bob Woodruff and his wife Lee is in its third week at number one. It follows the ABC newsman from his brain injury in Iraq through his recovery at home. Ishmael Bea describes his drug-crazed killing spree as a child soldier in Sierra Leone in A Long Way Gone, its second. In its 33rd week on the list, I Feel Bad About My Neck jumps from eighth to third, screenwriter Nora Ephron on aging. It's followed by The Audacity of Hope, Senator Barack Obama's look at faith, values, and American politics. Fifth is Infidel, Ayan Hirsi Ali's critique of the treatment of women in Islamic societies. The Hardcore Diaries is next. It's former professional wrestling champ Mick Foley's look at world wrestling entertainment. How Doctors Think debuts in the seventh spot. Harvard professor of medicine Jerome Groupman on the art of medical science. It's followed by Carter National Security Advisor Zbigniew Brzezinski's Second Chance. It's a critique of the foreign policy of the last three presidents. Next, somebody's got to say it. Radio talk show host Neil Bortz on poverty, prayer in schools, and race relations. And rounding out the top ten is The Innocent Man. John Grisham chronicles a near execution for murder and a subsequent exoneration. To view the complete list, visit the New York Times website at nytimes.com and click on books. Prayer that